Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, can I, first of all, ask you to do as I'm about to do myself, turn it off. Um, the emergency exits are the same ones that you came through, in case there is a, a problem. Uh, but otherwise, we are very pleased to be able to welcome Werner Hoy, and for the first time here uh, in Ireland, uh, but you're very welcome. And um, we've a group of colleagues who are looking forward to hearing what you have to say, over 20 odd minutes, and then we're going to do questions and answers for another 20 minutes, and then we'll, we'll safely feed you and let you go on your way. Okay, Perfect. floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be back to Ireland, not the first time, to Dublin, not the first time, to this institute, not the first time, but it's always good to be here. And when I planned together with Andrew McDool, our new vice president in the bank, this visit, we thought we might pick an important date. So we had, uh, it was all prearranged over the last week, so I'm aware that today well, maybe at least by prepared text, a little bit out of tune with what, what people are discussing now. And uh, when I woke up this morning and I was warned by Mr. Tusk's office last night that there would be something important coming this morning, uh, I uh, was impressed by the commitment that was there. But the more I thought about it, the more question marks came up with me, and they have not disappeared since. So uh, <laughs> let's hope that the goodwill, at least, that has been invested into this accord will translate into something that will impress us very much next week when the European Council convenes and the declaration between 27 plus 1 will come out and give some per perspectives of how this will continue. It's a pleasure to be back um, at this important time, but not only because of the remarkable announcement this morning, but also because of the six years that I can now look back at uh, my engagement in Ireland in my present capacity. That's almost on the day, six years now. And um, all in all, uh, since my first visit as a government member to Ireland, uh, quarter of a century ago, uh, I've been observing what's going on in this country for more of half of the membership of uh, Ireland in the European Union, and it's just breathtaking and amazing. And uh, when we signed at County Fingal yesterday a, a big agreement, a big loan from the development of, of that county, uh, I must say, uh, I would not have considered this, this possible uh, just uh, six years ago, if not 25 years ago. It's really amazing, and it is so strong, uh, gives you so strong feelings when you see that uh, this uh, vocation européenne of Ireland is completely out of question in this country. Sometimes, however, when I discuss, when I present ideas and projects of the European Investment Bank, the EU Bank, I think we are making a big mistake of not telling the good stories about Europe. We allow European councils to develop in ways that after the meeting, the heads of state and government address the national press conferences, tell the, their own domestic journalists, how great they were, how much they have achieved it to the detriment of the others. Uh, Mario Monti once told me uh, a story and put this into a nice picture. He said, when I, when, when I used to be Prime Minister of Italy, we all used to go to European councils as heads of state and government, and everybody brought a brick. And we put the bricks together, and over time, we erected quite an impressive edifice with these bricks. Nowadays, we are talking about zero-sum games, and uh, everybody's trying to take the brick of the others and put it into the uh, erection of the own, own statute at home. I think uh, if we don't talk about the European value added, the uh, 
uh, win-win situations that Europe produces, then we cannot be surprised that uh, people might get disenchanted or even get into temptation to vote negatively during a referendum. And uh, I think this is an issue that it's, needs to be addressed by the European Council. Because obviously if uh, you maintain a position where everything that works in this country or in other countries is due to the geniality of the local politicians and everything that does not work in Europe is due to the idiocy of the Brussels bureaucrats. If that propaganda lasts for 25 years, then you can't be surprised that afterwards somebody might vote negatively in a referendum when the prime minister all of a sudden says, but now you must vote in favor of Europe. It might not work as we've seen. And this is a, such a painful process that we are presently going through with the departure of the United Kingdom. From an EIB point of view, uh, it is a terrible loss. The European Investment Bank loses one of its strongest shareholders, 16% of the shares, uh, almost 10 billion euros of lending per year, a very, very good portfolio that we have in the United Kingdom. All this is painful enough. We also leave, lose a strong supporter on key objectives of the EU bank on innovation, on energy efficiency, on climate change policy, and also on development. DFID is one of our strongest partners in our third world activities. So that's pain enough, but in addition to that, and this is something that is overlooked, and I have to explain it to members of the European Council all the time now, because they must know that, the prudential and statutory limitations of a bank depend upon the capital and the multiplier that you might be allowed to use in order to calculate the maximum lending space you have. And EIB is a very special animal, uh, in this respect second to none in the world, because there is no other bank in the world who would proportionally make of only 14 billion euros cash injected into this bank over 60 years. It has been only 14 billion euros. A lending volume of 85 billion per year, a loan book or balance sheet of 600 billion euros, and a number of EIB bonds flying around the world of 500 billion euros because we have to capitalize completely on the capital markets. Everything we finance, everything we lend, we have to also to borrow. So people in the bank are always so proud to say we are the biggest multilateral lender in the world, which is definitely true. We are two and a half times the size of the World Bank. But unfortunately, we're also the biggest multilateral borrower in the world because next year, according, well, dep dependent on reflows, we'll have to go to the capital markets and ask them to lend us 70 to 90 billion euros in 2018. So it's a very strong market orientation there. And this lending space that the European Investment Bank has on the basis of a capital paid in and callable capital of 240 billion euros will be reduced by 16% of the 240 billion capital, that's roughly 40 billion, and a gearing ratio of 2.5. That means by 2019, 2020, we'll have to see that our maximum lending volume will be reduced by 100 billion euros, which would translate in a reduction of our business in the European Union and outside development from 85 billion in the year 2017 to below 50 billion in the year 2020. So it is really significant. Their Brits are have blowing us a real, real bad deal. Well, I'm sure the member states of the European Union, the 27, will not allow that to happen. And thank God we don't need cash. If now I had to go to the European Council and would say we need cash in order to compensate for that, I think we would be in tr big trouble because some member states would not even be able to, to cash in what we need. So we can transform reserves into paid in capital, but that already is a quite a bit. Unless you want to see the bank shrinking. And uh, 
we don't go for volume or for size because of volume or size, but, or but because we believe we, we are so beautiful, we, I think we are needed. And uh, I remember my first visits in my capacity as president of EIB here in, in Dublin. Wow, at that time we were really needed. And I think we had very good talks at that time and brought about a considerable contribution to the recovery of Ireland at that time. Other countries are still in that similar difficulty and need us. And beyond that, if we really have now overcome the counter-cyclical necessities of the bank, because the economic crisis is coming to an end in most countries now, we can finally address the real issues which are so important for the competitiveness of Europe in the world. And these are structural weaknesses of our economy. These are the huge investment gaps which we have in the European Union. These are the enormous gaps we have when it comes to research and development, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to uh, the access to finance for, for small and medium-sized companies, which is still one of the biggest weaknesses of Europe in comparison, for instance, to the United States, where 85% or 80% at least of corporate financing takes place via the capital markets, while more than 75% of this kind of financing in Europe takes place via banks, which have their limitations. So it is a really important time for, for the bank, and Brexit is therefore not only for Ireland of crucial, of vital importance, how we handle this, also for your bank. A year ago, this week, a former Taoiseach, Ender Kenny, which we met last night together with Michael Noonan and expressed our gratitude for many years of excellent cooperation, he opened then the EIB Dublin office, our first permanent presence in Ireland, run by Cormac Murphy, our, there he is, <laughs> our, our ambassador to Ireland, well, ambassador to your own country, that's, that's quite consistent, but he definitely is the, the face of the bank here in Ireland next to Vice President Andrew McDool. Um, today, after, one year after this meeting, we, we are signing the EIB's largest ever loan for investment in this country. The 25-year, 490 million euro loan will support the construction of the new National Children's Hospital and finance nearly 50% of the total cost. A huge endeavor. We just were there. I've never been welcomed more coldly than at that site outside there in... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this this huge huge compound, but it's a heartwarming event if you see what is going to happen after a discussion of 25 years about the construction of this hospital. It's a, it's a great thing for us. It represents the largest ever financial engagement by the union's long-term lending institution in Ireland and the first EIB backing for a hospital in this country. Alongside support for the new hospital, this visit also provides an opportunity to, to demonstrate the broader engagement of the bank in Ireland. Last night in Swords, the chief executive, Fingal County Council, and I signed a 70 million euro loan that will support 180 million euros of investment to upgrade and improve transport, economic, cultural, and natural heritage across the country. This is one of a number of new initiatives supported by the EIB Group in Ireland, backed by the Juncker Plan, the joint EIB European Commission plan that was set up, that was invented four years ago, was set up three years ago, was considered voodoo economics at that time because we promised to make an additional investment of 350 billion out of a guarantee facility that was fed by or out of EU budget and EIB reserves of 21 billion euros. So the, the pseudo precision of the 350 billion stem from the simple multiplication of uh, 21 as the guarantee facility times the factor of 15 because uh, Mr. Juncker at that time sitting in my office in the ninth floor of the building in, in Luxembourg uh, when we, among four eyes, developed this Juncker plan basic idea, said, well, if, you, if, we, if we find a guarantee facility uh, of these 25, 21 billion euros, what can you make out of it? What, what can the multiplier be? And we just have had the experience with the capital increase a few years ago, 
where we had to deliver a multiplier of 18 within three months, uh, three years, and we reached these uh, 18 after already 27 months. So obviously it worked very, very well with the capital increase. Now, how does that work with a, a guarantee facility? And we said, well, there is no mathematical precision. This is a thumb rule. So with riskier projects, smaller projects, a factor of 18 might not be safely attainable, but 15 we may, might get. And this is what brought the strange fi figure of 315 into a speech text of Mr. Juncker at that time. Um, it is uh, amazing that, uh, well, six months before the three years are over, 80% of that dimension have been reached. So the Juncker plan is a success, and uh, this initiative today is part of the implementation of the Juncker plan. Furthermore, today I will visit, later today I will visit the site of the future redevelopment at Grange Gorman, expected to be by 110 million euros from the EU bank. Earlier this day, the third meeting of the Ireland EIB financing group, chaired by Minister Donahue, saw the future engagement of the EIB in key sectors discussed, and it also provided an opportunity to hear how future health, transport, agriculture, and business investment could be enhanced with the support of the EIB group. We welcome the initiative of the Irish authorities to identify areas where the EU bank can increase engagement, and early next year we will confirm new financing to support capital investment where it is most needed. And that's the kind of action, of joint action, that is needed, and it is indicative of how the EU bank with the Irish authorities are focusing not just on the short term, but on structural issues to help put Ireland on the path of sustainable growth. This brings me to the subject of today's speech, investing in Europe's future from recovery to sustainable growth. In Europe, we have been confronted with a series of challenges that have tested the core foundations of the European project. We have experienced a decade of uncertainty, which at the same time was a decade of inward looking. It started with the first global financial and later sovereign crisis, it spread to our economic outlook, and over time it has had significant impact on politics and policy. Now, more than ever, in our, before, ever before in our recent history, it is a time to act. We as Europeans must see these developments as a wake-up call and be reminded of the value of the European project and what is at stake. It is my great privilege in my position of the president of this bank to travel throughout the world and listen to views of Europe from outside the Union. And I'm constantly reminded that the European Union is seen as a model for peace and economic prosperity, freedom and solidarity for many around the world. And Minister Donahue this morning reminded me of the Peace Bridge Derry, which is a symbol of the way that Europe contributes to growing together, to overcoming cleavages and to, to bridging gaps like Europe was the key requisite, a prerequisite, for my country to be able to be reunited three decades ago and overcome the terrible division of Europe at that time. And this is an observation that I hold to be true and a message that needs to be shared. I'm deeply saddened, therefore, by the decision of the British electorate to leave the European Union. We have seen that the message of hope and the value of the European project was not communicated and received by important parts of the population. Our bank is directly affected by Brexit as a major state member state is leaving and mitigating actions will need to be taken. I dwelt upon that already before. The treaty is clear and the status of the bank is as well. We are based in the treaties of Rome and now the Treaty of Lisbon, a primary law-based institution of the European Union. So uh, the treaty says only member states of the European Union can be members of the EIB. It is beyond our remit to think about treaty change, but I'm always a bit skeptical when it comes to treaty change deliberations because that treaty change Temptations might, might be joined by those who have con completely different objectives when they think about amendments of the treaty. 
So probably our political leaders will be very careful to engage in such an exercise. So therefore, if and when the UK leaves the EU, it ceases to be a member of EIB. The difficulties of the negotiations are obvious. Michel Barnier has the, the unenviable task of leading the negotiations on the side, EU side to disentangle the UK from the EU and settle the past. And of course, I will not enter into the details of this negotiation. I just can report to you that the cooperation with the Michel Barnier team is excellent. And we have made best experiences uh, recently, again, with the way he performs. Because you have to be aware that in a negotiation that is naturally on the side of the political leaders, focus on the entire integration process and on bu budgetary considerations as far as money is concerned, uh, we are a little bit odd men out because we are not budget-based, we are capital market-based. And therefore, uh, it is sometimes overlooked that while the EU budget per year is roughly 140 billion euros, uh, the contribution that comes from us via loans and guarantees and financial instruments is 85 billion euros. So that is a considerable part of the package that Monsieur Barnier has to negotiate upon uh, as a representative of all of us among the 27. Um, I hope that Brexit alongside other political developments both on our continent and across the Atlantic, not to forget across the Atlantic, could represent a collective European awakening, a turning point that leads to greater European self-belief. Against this background, the subject matter of today seems more, than pressing, more pressing than ever, namely, how should we invest in Europe's future to put it on the path of sustainable growth? European efforts at firefighting be they on the financial, economic, or political front, have tested the strength of our commitment to joined up European action and diverted our attention away from our longer-term goal of making Europe more resilient in the future. Let me outline three pillars of a joined up EU response with a particular focus, of course, on the role of the EU bank. First, the first pillar is based on furthering financial sector integration and establishing a central fiscal capacity. Secondly, the second pillar targets the need to improve EU competitiveness. And finally, the third pillar emphasizes the importance of strengthening cohesion and convergence. To the first. A more resilient Europe requires greater financial sector integration and fiscal capacity. Strengthening financial sector integration at the euro area level will help maintain financial stability against country-specific shocks and support the transmission of monetary policy. It will also be good for the EU as a whole. As a matter of fact, now that the United Kingdom is obviously leaving the European Union, the congruence of EU and Euro area is, is growing considerably. And that means that we have to overcome this sometimes a little bit artificial division between these spheres. I, as president of EIB, have deliberately never participated in the Eurogroup meeting because uh, non-Euro countries are always insistent that I begin each and every speech by the sentence, we are not the bank of the 19, we are the bank of the 28. However, with the biggest non-Euro member leaving and with all the others, with the exception of Denmark, having a commitment to one day join the Eurogroup of the Euro area, I think there's something we need to think about if we don't want to waste the potential contribution of EIB to the overall development of the Eurozone and the European Union. To deepen integration, we must step up ongoing efforts towards the banking union and the capital markets union. We would need a financial system that channels savings effectively to the best productive investment opportunities within the European single market. And we must ensure that improvements in financial markets are not due to extraordinary monetary stimulus, but rather reflect a durable strengthening of cross-border investment. ECB has bought us time, and I think we can be grateful to Mario Draghi for his resolve in critical times, doing what it takes, whatever it takes. It was the right answer, the right signal at that time. But we all knew that this is not sustainable very long. 
the member states must use the time in order to bring about their, natural, their, their necessary structural amendments. And this has not been done everywhere. It has been painful and tough for Ireland, but it has worked in other places of Europe. It has not worked, at least not fully worked yet. So we have now, we now have to brace for cautious withdrawal of the monetary policy impulses that we have benefited from at first. While much has been achieved in terms of strengthening the euro area, we still have a way to go. There are ongoing discussions on developing a common fiscal capacity to help absorb shocks to the eurozone economy. In this discussion, we should not allow ourselves to be too preoccupied with symbolic themes, which, however, are the key headline-producing thoughts in the media, such as the designation of a Eurozone finance minister or the nature of a Eurozone budget line. We are, will be caught in the next years in a fierce battle between those who seek further integration and strengthening of the community method and those who believe that the next steps in the deepening of the European Union integration will have to go by the detour of intergovernmental cooperation. And this will be the main problem, and this is the difference between the proposals that are present on the market, again this week, by the proposal coming from President Juncker and the Commission, which uh, obviously strengthen also in the monetary sphere the community method, while the proposals coming from several member states go obviously into the direction of strengthening the Eurozone as a concentric circle within the European integration process, uh, and uh, on the basis of a, a uh, reliance on intergovernmental cooperation, oh, yeah, time, and less the, uh, the uh, community methods. So I believe that we should concentrate on what we need. What we need in the European Union, the strengthened Eurozone, deepened Eurozone, is a financial backstop. What it needs is a backstop facility with funds for crisis scenarios, because we will not be able and we should not rely on the IMF as much as we have done in the past. The role can be played, should be played by ESM, which can be further elaborated, but it is already far developed. And I think the ESM is an excellent institution that serves the Eurogroup very well. The second competent require, component required is an investment facility, which is in difficult times can, can act counter-cyclically to quickly channel investments where they're needed most and which in normal times can address the structural weaknesses of the European economy and this instrument exists as well. This is the EU bank, that's the EIB. There is great potential for complementarity and mutual reinforcement between the institutions. We are in very close contact with them and we are discussing these issues in detail. This potential collaboration could make the EMU more robust providing a central fiscal capacity to first, that fosters competitiveness and furthers convergence of the EMU, while at the same time provides a stabilization mechanism, and that could then fulfill a critical fiscal policy role that complements monetary policy. Europe must become more competitive. I will cut that short upon request of the chairman. Uh, but uh, I think we have to see that... Uh, during the 10 years that we have invested into inward looking and in crisis management in Europe, the rest of the world has moved forward. And if you look at, we look at the competitiveness comparisons between uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, South Asia, and the United States and Canada, we have lost many years and we need to catch up on this. So it is time to end the inward looking and to mobilize our efforts to recover the costs of a largely lost decade, which uh, we have behind us in terms of competitiveness. So the good news is the economy is back on track in Europe, but the picture would not be completely healthy if one wouldn't see that our researchers under the leadership of Andrew McDool, who is now the responsible vice president for the economic department of the bank, uh, shows that, or suggests an annual investment gap in the EU of about 600 billion euros, which uh, a gap which has a huge effect, again, on the competitiveness position of euro. The worst being uh, infrastructure, uh, 
And second, key strategic areas like uh, research and development, climate and environment. And last but not least, uh, digital and innovation. A quantum leap is needed there. Countries such as my own, own, own one, uh, which always believe uh, it has the biggest strength you can think of, is the weakest when it comes to digitalization and probably ranks somewhere between 23 and 25 in the list of the 28 in the, the implementation of the, the digitalization objectives. So the EIB obviously can play uh, an important role there. We have been providing around 85 billion euros in long-term financing in 2016. And the overall support that uh, was brought about led to an increased volume of investment in Europe of 280 billion euros. Uh, I will not talk about the activities outside the European Union, but there the bank will have to play a role when implementing EU foreign and uh, cooperation policies in the next years. So what we need here basically is to take advantage of the uh, lessons learned from the Juncker plan where we saw that the, trend, the, the paradigm change in the use of the EU budget away from subsidies and grants towards more guarantees and loans and use of financial instruments must be continued and also translated into other fields of policy. I'm a strong advocate for applying these uh, lessons learned also on development policy because if you look at the sustainable development goals to which all our member states subscribed to heavily in New York two years ago and the climate goals of Paris, we will never be able to reach that if we don't use financial instruments more and make a better use of scarce budgetary resources. Last word on impact, and uh, Mr. McDougall could talk hours about this because he has been guiding the research activities with the Romolo uh, model of the European Commission in, in Sevilla. That is a pretty, I would say, uh, instrumentally and analytically strong method of measuring impact of activities and the impact measurement of the activities of the bank in 2015 and 2016 came to the conclusion that it created something in the order of 2.25 uh, million extra jobs after five years. Uh, with a 2.3 increase in GDP in the short term and over the long term, the impact on productivity and competitiveness is the key issue. And we believe we can say that the level change in the EU economy of around 1.27 billion extra jobs and a GDP that is 1.5% higher than it would have been in the baseline scenario is impressive. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are just estimates or calculations, but based on very serious assumptions and calculations, and they make us help, make, might uh, make us uh, better understand the centrality of EU-level investment support to our efforts to strengthen the Eurozone and the EU. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to continue our role there. We are in the service of the member states of the European Union and the European Union in general, and I think we have shown also in this country that the contribution of the EU bank can be significant. And finally, I go back to where I began. Let's tell the stories about Europe better, and then accidents like Brexit decisions would probably have less, less of a probability to be seen. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions.